Hey everyone, it's Bradley Rosa with the Broward County Bar Buzz. I'm here today with Ken Miller of Halitzer, Pettis, and Schwamm. Today we're going to discuss damages in medical malpractice cases, specifically if there are any kind of caps in sovereign immunity. So, welcome Ken. Thank you, Bradley. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So, we really wanted to talk today about the caps that are out there that people don't even realize exist with uh, negligence cases, specifically with uh, medical malpractice? Yes. Um, there is what's called sovereign immunity, and, and it's a concept that goes back to old England that basically said you couldn't blame the crown for any of the mistakes they made, and that kind of carried over when the United States was formed, and you couldn't sue the government if they injured you. you know, so if you had a government vehicle or something like that and they hurt you like in an auto accident, you couldn't sue them. Um, that was the law in Florida until 1975 when the legislature said, well, that's a little unfair. So they passed a, a waiver of sovereign immunity to a limited extent and said, well, if you've got a claim for negligence, you know, you've been injured by a government actor, we'll let you sue them but we're gonna put a cap in as to what you can recover. And, and the concept behind it is, whenever you have to sue a government agency, you're really suing taxpayer dollars. So this is the trade-off that they came up with to try to allow people to recover, but at the same time, protect the budgets of the state and their entities. So when I think of sovereign entities, I would think of police officers, uh, firefighters, those kind of folks, God forbid, uh, you know, you get hit, hurt by a police officer or something happens uh, with the fire department. Those I think most people would think of as sovereign actors, uh, but there are other entities that are sovereign actors. Can you get into that? Because I think it'll shock people. Sure. So in addition to the cities themselves and the county for that matter, uh, you've got, for example, the Broward County School Board. The school board has sovereign immunity. So in other words, if you're injured by a school board employee, whether it's driving a truck or something like that, this law would apply to you. It also comes into effect in medical malpractice cases, particularly in Broward County, because we have several public taxpayer-funded hospitals. In the south, we have the Memorial Healthcare System, which has four hospitals. And in the north, we have Broward Health, which has their hospitals. And those hospitals, in addition to the government entities, enjoy sovereign immunity as well. So if something were to happen to you where a doctor just screwed it all up, and you know, was totally negligent, if even found negligent, and they are in this hospital system, there'd be certain limitations? Yes, however, there's a, there's a distinction there because it applies to anybody who's employed by the hospital. So for example, at Memorial Hospital, I happen to know all of the neurosurgeons and a lot of the cardiologists, they're actually employees of Memorial Hospital. So if they were to make a mistake and commit malpractice and you wanted to sue them, you can't sue the doctor individually. You can only sue the hospital, and then there's this cap that applies to any damage claims that you have. Other hospitals have doctors who are not employees. You know, you have a surgeon that may come in or a family doctor. They're not employees of the hospital, so sovereign immunity typically doesn't apply to them. It's more the employees of the hospital that it affects. So let's talk about these damages and, and sovereign immunity in, in this doctor who's committed malpractice. What, what are the caps there? So today, uh, the caps are $200,000 per claimant or $300,000 per claim. And what that means is if there's more than one person involved, hypothetically you have a husband and a wife, one of them is the injured patient, the other one also gets a claim under the law Combined, there is a $300,000 cap. It's the most you could ever collect on their behalf. If it's a single individual, it's $200,000 per claim. So typically, we're talking off, ca off camera about damages, and so there's different damages. I think there's three or four um, in normal cases. So talk a little bit about that, and, and now you're saying that it doesn't matter. It would all be, all of those damages would fall into that one? Correct. So if you have a claim against the sovereign, if you're suing a hospital, for example, you can have a claim for lost wages as a result of the injury, medical expenses, pain and suffering type damages, all of those things combined, there's a cap 
and you can only collect $200,000 irrespective of what the value of those damages are under this law. Wow. There is an exception, and the one exception is uh, if you go all the way through to a trial, you can get a judgment. In other words, a jury awards you more than the $200,000. The judge would then reduce the jury award to the, ver to the judgment amount of $200,000, and you can try to take the verdict to the legislature because they can pass what's called a claims bill and decide to award you more money than the $200,000. But that's the only way to get beyond the cap. And historically speaking, how often has that happened? It doesn't happen very often. Um, it's happened very infrequently recently, uh, maybe a couple, three times a year. Uh, the majority of the ones that you even hear about are claims that have been languishing for five, ten years where they keep going to the legislature year after year. You have to get a sponsor. Somebody at the legis you know, one of the legislators has to sponsor a bill. It has to go before the House. It has to go before the Senate. It's got to go, you know, through committees, just like any other piece of legisla legislation does, and then it's got to be signed by the governor. So most of the time when you hear a claims bill getting passed, it involves some type of catastrophic injury that literally happened years ago that they've been waiting to get this money. Goodness, so you have to be careful about where you go to your hospitals. <laughs> well, yes, uh, you know, the other thing is it also affects whether or not you can actually get a lawyer to represent you in a case like this. My firm, we do medical malpractice. We represent injured people. And one of the things that we evaluate when a claim comes to us is who are the potential defendants, right? right. Do you have doctors? Do you have hospitals? And if it turns out that the only claim is uh, going to be against a sovereign hospital, more often than not, it's not a case that's likely to get brought because the costs are so high in bringing malpractice cases that by the time you get to the end, even if you get the full $200,000, the client winds up with practically nothing. It costs that much to take those kind of cases to trial? Uh, medical malpractice cases are very expensive. Once you, if it's a case with multiple experts, I mean, we frequently see cases where you spend fifty, dollars $100,000 in costs just to get a case to trial, and that's not very uncommon. Wow. Goodness. So if someone gets hurt, they need to be cognizant of the fact where they got hurt or where this medical malpractice occurred, that if it's in one of these hospitals, you likely don't have a claim or anything that a lawyer won't take. Well, yeah, and, and, and most of the time, though, people don't know that, and so they, they bring the case to a lawyer, and one of the lawyer's jobs and one of the things we do is we look through and try to figure it out. Do we have other people involved? Are there doctors or health care providers that are involved that are not employees of the hospital that may have also been involved in the negligence because there's different insurance coverages and there is money to go after. If you've got other people, let's say a, do a couple doctors involved in a case, oftentimes the lawyers will sue the sovereign hospital and include them in the case. It's just a situation where it becomes very impractical if they're the only defendant in the case. Um, you know, not all lawyers are, well, lawyers aren't required to, to carry their own insurance, right? legal malpractice. Technically, Technically no. Technically, no. no. It's a smart idea to, to have you know, insurance that would protect you. Correct. Uh, question, is that the same for doctors? So in this state, the law is that as a physician, you either have to have insurance coverage that will cover you for a claim up to $250,000, or you have to be able to financially satisfy a $250,000 judgment against you. Generally, that's been interpreted as you have a fund somewhere, you put money in an account, you can show that this money is there. That's what the law requires. Hmm. Practically speaking, though, that does not happen very often. There are many, many doctors, and some of it legit, because the cost of malpractice insurance, depending on your specialty, is exorbitant. Uh, I represented years ago when I was doing defense work an obstetrician who said that to get a policy that covered him for $250,000, a one-year premium was like $200,000. So he's like, worth it. that's crazy. I'm not going to pay that. I t I'd rather take my chances and have to put my own money up. So technically, the law requires one or the other. It's just not enforced all that much by the state. So that means that even if it wasn't, let's say the doctor is not part of that hospital system, there's a good chance that they may not have insurance 
and that they may only be able to cover it up to a certain point, and it could be much more expensive, right? Correct. If you, if you ever go into a doctor's office, if they do not have malpractice insurance, they are required, and most of them do, to have a sign that is posted in their lobby that tells you they don't carry <laughs> malpractice insurance. Really? Yes. So if you ever go to your doctor's office and they don't have insurance, they will have a notice up there because that's a requirement. 99% of the people never look at that, and even if they did, they wouldn't know what it meant. Correct. But that is part of the law. So if there are doctors that don't have insurance, they will have a sign in their lobby posted saying they don't have it. How do you deal, have you dealt with cases like that before where uh, you, know, you go after a doctor, he or she doesn't have uh, any kind of coverage, and now you're going after someone who only has limited funds? It, it really depends on the case. There are a lot of times where you evaluate that and you have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the client. And you say, look, you've got a legitimate case. Somebody did something wrong. You've got legitimate injuries. But the likelihood is you're either A, never going to collect anything, or B, the amount you're going to collect is so small that you need to really make a decision. Is it worth it to you emotionally, financially, and just dealing with it to go through this knowing that the recovery is not potentially there. And it's a difficult conversation to have with people. It's one we have way more than I'd like because we have to explain to people, yeah, you have a legitimate claim, but we can't really help you. I, I can imagine that doctors figure out ways to you know, protect themselves. I'm, I'm assuming you're separating your business from your personal. They can have a million dollar home uh, you know, retreat in Colorado or something, but disconnect that from their business? I'm sure that anybody that chooses not to have insurance probably has met with people that has set up a financial plan to protect themselves. Yeah. You know, I've, I've never been involved in that kind of representation, so I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, we've all heard stories of things like that. Right. So you've got a tough job just actually finding clients that you can actually take care of because there seems to be so many obstacles. There are. Uh, you know, unlike general personal injury cases, a car accident, a slip and fall, where, you know, the liability is pretty easy to figure out. Either somebody ran a red light or they didn't, or there's a, a broken sidewalk you tripped over or there isn't. There's so many obstacles to bring a malpractice case, and, you know, it's, it's intentional. The legislature has created a lot of those obstacles because they were trying to reduce the amount of claims, but it winds up with a lot of people who have legitimate issues and legitimate damages that unfortunately don't get to recover. Wow. Well, still uh, impaired, it's, it, people would still need to come see you to figure out if they do have a claim. So how would, uh, how would someone get a hold of you? The easiest way to get a hold of us is to call us. Uh, our number is 954-523-9922. And your email? And my email is kmiller at hpslegal.com. Uh, you know, one of the things we tell people, at least at our firm, is even if we can't help you, we can help you get the answers to your questions. And the answer may be something you don't like, either somebody didn't do something wrong or they did, but there's nothing you can do about it. But either way, we can help you get the answers you're looking for, even if it's not satisfying to you. Goodness. Ken, thanks for uh, educating us on something that uh, doesn't have a good taste, but people need to know about it. People need to know about it, and, and again, if you ever have questions about what's applicable and what's not, your best choice is to contact a lawyer, and we're happy to, to answer those questions for you. Thanks again, Ken. Appreciate it. Thank